Party people, what's up? It's your boy BQ back up in the place to be once again. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for July 18, 2024. The go home, the go home show for Slammiversary. I get on here a few times every year, talk to you about how I think go home shows that the go home shows that they do are no good. They're usually my least favorite episodes of the year. I'm here to tell you they did an excellent job with this episode. I thought they they nailed a lot of things. Of course, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna tell you some of the things that I don't like, but I thought they did a, a pretty pretty good job with this as far as just um really building some emotion, get get a little momentum. You know, it was not a flat episode. They've done some very, very flat episodes uh before pay-per-views. So I thought they did a very good job here, and uh, I will preview Slammiversary when I'm done here. It's the, today's the day of Slammiversary, so I had to make sure I, I got up pretty early today to knock this out for you guys. So I'm going to give you one final reminder that I'll be leaving for my honeymoon. I thought I was leaving Sunday. Uh, that's what happens when you're not the one who makes the travel plans. I'm leaving Monday, but I will be gone for a week. There's going to be no wrestling, no social media. Maybe a little social media here and there, but uh, for the most part, I'm going to be very disconnected. Um, we'll not be reviewing that uh, the Fallout episode, and I'll just get back in the saddle the following week. So there's just going to be no content. And then um, I also let you guys know that the majority of August, I'll be doing active duty hours, which doesn't mean I won't be able to review the show or anything. It's just that my schedule kind of turns upside down at that point, hours wise. So I end up having to record at different times and on different days. And, you know, we'll see how that goes as well. And then uh, we'll probably be slowing down the content in general for the rest of the year. I, I typically do about Slammiversary to the end of the year. I know I've been a little slow lately, but just because I don't know what to talk about, to be totally honest with you. Uh, but we're going to slow down the content a little bit because um, it's it just personal things with my own business that I'm picking up a couple more clients that it's just very important that I... Um, I do well with them. And then I have a, a third that I have to put a proposal together that I, I, I like really, really need them. So um, that's kind of like a game changer account for me. So I'm just, my focus is just going to be elsewhere for, for a little bit, if I'm just being totally honest with you. And uh, let's get into this. Let's, let's talk about this uh, go home show that I thought was, you know, I thought, I thought, I thought they did a very good job with this. I was, I was kind of not looking forward to watching it because, you know, as I said, it's difficult for me personally to watch an episode and then watch a pay-per-view. And it's just a lot of Tom and, and Matt's voices, you know, and I think they purposely, this is the like one true negative, which is more of a personal negative. I think they, they purposely try to piss me off this episode because they both were so annoying. Um, we started off with the, the uh the highlights from last week with the Frankie Gazarian thing. The acting was so fucking bad. Oh my lord. But it was still like very well shot and well produced. And we want to see more of this stuff going forward, you know, the kind of the cinematic stuff. And as soon as we're done, it's Tom Hannafin saying, you know, where are the 2300 right I mean, he was like inaudible. That's I was like, okay, here we go. Here we go. They're like, they are trying to piss me off on purpose this episode. Uh, there was one point when the Hardys came out. He said, Matt, Matt. He sounded like my cat who's locked in the, uh, who sleeps in the uh, laundry room every night. Rah! Anyway, we kick it off with the no quarter catch crew versus the Rascals and Kushida. I thought this was a really fun opening match on the surface i said okay it's going to be really over choreographed a lot of the rascals matches tend to be uh but it they it was very well i mean it kind of was to an extent but it was very well balanced out with the style that the no quarter catch crew which i don't have a clue what that name means someone will have to light enlighten me on that but with the style that they have the, uh, it just all meshed together, blended very well, and it was just it was it was fun. It was it was a it was a really good match to watch. 
was a great way to open the show. Um, Tom asked Matt at one point, he goes, what's your impression of the no quarter catch crew? And then Matt goes, <laughs> I mean, again, completely inaudible for the first few seconds of him speaking. So that's why I was like, these guys are trying to piss me off this episode. They know that I have to sit through. Um, and, I, and of course, I'm just joking. But I was like, these motherfuckers know I got to sit through this episode late Friday night and then Saturday watch Slammiversary. By the way, running at the same time as the freaking uh, WNBA All-Star Weekend, I'm not a because I would r rather watch basketball than wrestling, but I know that I have a, a duty to you guys to watch Slammiversary as it airs, so um, kind of upset me when I realized they were both on the same weekend. I ended up having to watch uh, Impact very late last night because I was watching the uh, three-point contest and skills for the WNBA, so... I was like really falling asleep at the end of the episode. I was like, oh my God. So I had to wake up kind of early today to finish it up. But as I said, I thought this, I thought this was just a really fun opening, um, opening match. I, I've said this the last two or three weeks. They, they have a new formula for TV and it's com communicating to us. If we want to see clean wrestling, we want to see clean, decisive finishes, spend the money, order the pay-per-view. That's that's they have made that very, very clear. Um, and then they continue to this episode as well. So Gresham came down, uh, distra distracted Kushida, making it a three on two. And then uh, no, no quarter catch crew ultimately won the match. Very, very, imp excuse me, my, my eye, damn allergies. A very impressive offense uh, for the finisher. I thought it, I thought it looked really good. The Rascals did this triple drop kick at one point. If they've done it before. I've never seen it. I've never noticed, but I, I thought that was pretty cool as well. So no quarter catch crew wins. And then uh, I would imagine if you're watching on TV, it cut to a commercial at this point, and then it cuts to the treehouse, And the rascals are selling nothing, which I would have just done this segment later in the episode because especially watching on TNA plus you watch no quarter catch crew beat these guys. And when they hit the final, fin when they hit the finisher, but uh, I think, what's his fuck, Patrick Dempsey, um, hit the uh, dragon, I'm trying to think what the hell that move's called. It's kind of the uh, German suplex in a full Nelson. Uh, who knows? Like, I give a shit. Anyway, when he hit that, Wentz really sold that thing. I mean, he had his eyes rolled in the back of his head. So when you're watching on TNA Plus, you see him, them hit you know a finisher, which is essentially like three finishers in a row. He's got his eyes rolling in the back of the head. And then five seconds later, he's yamming it up in the treehouse. That's how it came off on TNA Plus. So that's, ba that's bad. Bad television. Uh, I've never enjoyed these treehouse segments. I didn't when they were a thing, and I, don't, I didn't hear either. But uh, that they are bringing Dez, a.k.a. Wesley, to Slammiversary. So uh, I know everyone's very excited about that. That's going to be really cool. It just sucks because we pretty much got the match already. They're just removing Kushida and putting in Wesley, if you will. And it's essentially the same fucking match. But it's whatever. Everyone's going to be very excited to see him, uh, to see him back in TNA. Um, it, it's really interesting because they, the Rascals back then never won the belt or anything like that and what i was told was that they communicated to uh impact back then very early on that they were likely leaving for wwe or for nxt once their contracts were up uh i would i would imagine it was kind of communicated like hey this is our stepping stone company we're trying to get discovered then we're going to move on to nxt I, I believe that's how it was kind of communicated if i'm reading in between the lines and that's why they never really won the titles or anything like that. I thought the the send off episode was very silly that they did for them, uh, where they were crying and all that, because they've, they haven't done anything like that for anybody else who's had more of an imp impact on the company. So I thought that was all really weird back then. But yeah, that, that's kind of what I was under the impression that they um, they communicated for a while that they weren't resigning. Um. Then we got Alicia Edwards versus Zaya Brookside. 
I was really excited about this. The only thing that would have made it better if it was a BQ on a pole match. Um, and, and man, some of you people get in the comments when I make comments about the knockouts being hot or whatever. And so oh, aren't you, aren't you married? Don't you have a wife? Like I have the, I am so secure in my marriage and my relationship. We are so secure in one another. We talk like this to each other. We're watching, you know, our show, our favorite show, the bachelor, the bachelorette, or we're watching our trash reality show. Like we're going to, we, we talk about the people on screen that are hot. You know what I mean? Like that's, we're very confident in us. So you can miss me with the white knight bullshit. A couple of you guys. Okay. You can fucking miss me all day with that shit. I assure you we're very secure in what we have. Anyway, get off my high horse there for a second. The good thing is Matt Raywall was a heel for this entire episode, except the opening match. Because Raywall is a heel when the system is involved, when Mustafa Ali is involved, and when Ash by Elegance is involved. And I think those are the only ones. But because someone from that group of wrestlers was pretty much a part of every single match throughout the rest of the show, Raywall was consistently a heel. So... Wrestling 101. Good for you, dude. Uh, but yeah, Alicia versus Zaya Brookside. All jokes aside, I, I was interested to see this because they are so similar in stature. And just their height, their build, so similar. And we, we've seen a lot of Alicia Edwards over the years, you know, matches over the years where people are like, well, she sucks. She can't wrestle. And, um, this was the one where she was kind of really matched up against someone of her own size. And we hadn't really seen anything like that before. And I, you know, I enjoyed it. I thought this was the best Alicia Edwards match ever. You know, she had a couple of the backstabber was a little, you know, a, a little off, but um, you know, for the most part, I thought they played off each other very well. They were able to execute all the moves because they were strong enough to uh, lift each other or pick each other up or, or do whatever, you know, like, I just I thought they put on a pretty um pretty solid match here. And uh again we're going it's it's interference from the outside. Okay, you want to watch clean wrestling, spend the money, break bread is what they're telling you. Uh Zaya Brooks I was thrown to the outside and Masha was going to she had her fireman's carry, I don't know what she was going to do. And then Spitfire immediately comes running out and attacking Masha. Uh, throws, you know, Zaya Brookside gets back in the ring. This distracts Alish, Alisha, and then uh, she hits her with the Brooksy bomb that she very much cooperated with. Um, and But Zaya Brookside <clears throat> gets the win, and she had a look on her face like it was the first win of her career. Uh, the way this all played out kind of told me that Alisha and Masha are going to win. I, I actually thought Spitfire, my money was on Spitfire to actually win the titles back. I don't, I don't want them to. But I thought they were going to. But just the way that they introduced the new militia t-shirt before the match. You know, this isn't WWE who once upon a time uh, put out this Y2AJ shirt for Jericho and and uh, AJ Styles as a way to throw off that Jericho was going to screw him over that episode. You know, this WWE has the money to kind of do that type of shit. I, I, I promise you, TNA did not put together this this t-shirt uh, for these two to lose the title. But they also teased by the way that Alicia got pinned that they were going to lose. So likely I see the militia uh, keeping their titles. That's what I, where I think it's going to go. I think when they ultimately lose it, militia, excuse me, Alicia slapping Masha after saying she costed the match type of thing. And they're going to break her off as a baby face from there. That's kind of what I think is going to happen. But uh, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy it. You know, maybe some of you guys didn't, but, I, you know, I say all the time, there's things that I don't enjoy that I figure a lot of you guys do just because we all have, all have different tastes. But I kind of just enjoyed watching um, Alicia actually being able to wrestle someone who was very similar in build to her. And then we, uh, we got a really great little Santana promo video package. And then we got Mustafa Ali pulling up in a limo. And then Cheeseball Mike Bailey, a.k.a. Mikey Mullet, uh, tries to attack him through the window. So another thing I've been saying is that there's, been, there's no good stories. 
leading up to Slammiversary. And some people have pointed out, well, the Ali cheese ball Mike thing, Mike Bailey thing has been very good. It has been, but what I was saying was Ali was carrying the entire thing and that Mike Bailey added absolutely nothing to it. I was able to change that uh, that opinion this episode. I thought between this and what we're going to get to here in a second, Mike Bailey added something to this feud, and they did a very good job building this to what I think, and I know Mike Gilbert agrees, I think this should be the main event of the show, but I don't think it's going to be. However, Mike Bailey did his part here. So after this attack, my worst fear was realized, and it was Cheeseball Mike Bailey in the middle of the ring with a microphone. Um, and and th- I hope that this doesn't happen again, because he is awful. He is all sorts of awful talking. But that aside, that aside, the promo aside, everything... Uh, that the two of them did here. I thought this segment went entirely too long, number one. Let me point that out. I thought it went way too long. But I thought they did a very excellent job of of building towards their match at Slammiversary. You know, and to an extent, the first couple matches did a pretty de- decent job, respectively, building for their matches as well. But uh, But this was the one, this was the real... Uh, the, the segment people were really talking about with this with this episode. So Ali is on the screen, and every time they do this, they always say the name twice. Bailey, hey Bailey, up here, <laughs> like, duh. Anyway, um, he lets him know that he has to. He's but he books matches now, uh, and long matches at that. You know, wrestlers. It's one thing when wrestlers book matches, but when they when they take up a third of the episode with their match, I think that's a little much. But anyway, he books a Secret Service gauntlet because Mike Bailey is saying he wants to fight, and like a heel, he says, "I'm not leaving until you come out here." The best part is that right after he said that, a fan yells, "Get out of the ring!" <laughs> oh man, that was some good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. But uh, Ali's on the screen goes, you still want to fight? And Mike Bailey shakes his head no for whatever reason. Uh, but then he says, just because he's a bad actor and he doesn't know how to, how he was supposed to respond, basically. He was trying to, he was shaking his head being like, you motherfucker, but the timing was absolutely awful. Anyway, Secret Service gauntlet and uh, he wrestles three or four of them. I want to say four. He beat two of them in about five seconds. Then he had an actual long match with one of them, and then uh, another short one, and then Singh comes down and says, well, I'm the final, he's the final boss, you know what I'm saying? He, he's the rock here. And again, at this point, I already had wrote down, this is, this is taking too long. It was, it, was just, it was just going a little long for my taste, but it was good television. So uh, Singh came down, and um, as he's walking down, uh, the... Uh, the, the uh, other two bodyguards and riot control gear come out. For whatever reason, Cheeseball Mike Bailey has his back to these two guys that are coming around from, clearly coming around from behind him. I understand there were some the Secret Service agents in front of him, but they were already dispatched. You know what I mean? They're already taken care of. And and uh, Singh was on the mic as well, but they he allowed the two people to come from behind, and Ali was one of them. And uh, and took the baton and, and beat him down. And then Frank the Goof is, of course, the referee for this thing. Uh, he comes over. One, two, three. He gets the... And Ali wins. So he says there's no match. <laughs> there's no match for anniversary because he already beat him. He was... So they had a segment backstage where he was celebrating. I knew with every fiber of my being that Santino was going to walk in, which he did. And let him know that he will strip him of the title if he doesn't show up at Slammiversary. After this, it was the system versus the Hardys. This is where uh, Tom Hanfin was like, Mah! so system versus the Hardys. The crowd was rocking for this. You know, like Tom liked to say, it's electric. It, w- it was electric. The crowd was absolutely rocking for this 
this looked and felt incredible on TV. And it really sucks that we didn't get this in front of a pay-per-view crowd. Uh, I said in my mailbag because I was I was pointing out why aren't the Hardys wrestling a slam anniversary, and then it was pointed out to me by a few people that Hardy can't Jeff Hardy can't get into the country. So uh, I really didn't take that into consideration. But it's it sucks that this wasn't the slam anniversary tag team match because I mean the place was fucking insane for this, and it shows why sometimes being a part of a smaller company and having the opportunity to be a big fish in a small pond uh, can really do a lot for your stock because, you know, these wrestlers say, okay, well, I'm going to move on to AEW, a bigger company and make more money. But then they get there and they're always just another guy, or just another girl or just another team. You know, people are sick of Deanna Perrazzo on AEW. She's still semi-featured. Uh, but it's almost like a joke, you know, like she does comment. Well, she's still feuding with Thunder Rosa and she has been for like four months and people are, you can see them in the social media comments. Like, is this feud going to end anytime soon? Uh, so they're like, but they're already kind of over her and they've, they've been over Ty Valkyrie and they, they're always over everybody because the, the roster is so bloated. The Hardys were just another tag team over there. They come here. TNA and their rock stars and they they work a match that they can work you know all these Jeff Hardy botches were showing up on online when he was in AEW because he they had him working matches that he can't work they're too old to do this type of style of match with these you know indie rific wrestlers who are here you got Brian Myers you got Eddie Edwards two guys who can fucking work and the match overall was very very good I thought Jade did a very good job in the entrances. She wasn't reading from a card like like uh, Penzer. The only weird thing is that Jade did a really good job of introducing the wrestlers, but she didn't call either team by their team name. She didn't say the Hardys or the system. She just called them by their individual names, and the crowd was looking to pop at the at at the announcement of the Hardys, but she didn't do it. And then she moves over to the system and the crowd again was looking to react. And she's just like Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers. And there's that little, are you done? Oh, but she's, she's starting to do very good. She looked great this episode as well, but this, this match here, man, um, really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. And then we ended up getting uh, the DQ finish where if we didn't have so many run-ins and faulty finishes and all this bullshit over the last month or two i thought this would have been a lot more of effective of a dq finish because this one didn't come off to me like uh okay we need an excuse to we don't want the hardies to lose we don't want to give <laughs> like the system doesn't need the momentum i mean come on but anyway this didn't come off like oh we we, we want we can't let the hardies lose so let's just do a bullshit DQ finish. This came off more as, you know, JDC runs down, causes disqualification. This came off more like, oh, fuck, man. The Hardys were right there. I want to see this match again. I just thought the oh, if that if that makes sense to you guys, there's a difference of someone doing a run-in for a match that's not really over, and it's just an excuse to end the match. Even though this was an excuse to end the match, it just came off more... Cause I guess because we were so invested in what they were doing and we were invested in the match, it just came off more like, oh, these motherfuckers, damn JDC. Let's I want the Hardys to get another crack at this thing down the road, you know? And this this is leading towards JDC and I can't believe I'm calling them that. Uh Dango versus Matt Hardy at the show. So I saw the match graphic come out before I saw the episode. I said, What the fuck is this? Why is Dango wrestling Matt Hardy? I was thinking when these graphics came out, wow, they had to have accomplished a lot this episode, and they actually did. I just wish there was the, the this episode had a sense of purpose and it had direction and focus. Where the previous episodes, even uh, as soon as last week, it didn't have that. There wasn't a sense of urgency on any of these episodes up to Slammiversary, but this one had a real, real sense of urgency. 
and then we get um some backstage stuff where so they 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 attacked Jeff Hardy after this. They had to write him off TV. <laughs> so that way we think that's why he can't go to Canada. And uh they have the real EMTs, no no fake phony doctors uh attending to him and they're putting him in the back of the ambulance. And then Tommy Dreamer, you got to get Tommy Dreamer on the show cuz it's 2300 Arena. 2300, 1500, whatever. Um he comes and it's hardy, you know, Rebby's been attacked. <laughs> so they run to Rebby and no one's even with Rebby taking care of her. She they just left her by herself. But she is saying JDC did this. And she's in the back corner. I don't even know what she was doing hanging hanging out there, but she said JDC did this. So we got guys attacking chicks now. But they're they're putting some heat on Dango. You know, they're they're they tried a couple different gimmicks with him with his time in TNA. Mixed results, but they've done more for him this last these last three weeks than the entire year or two years, whatever that he's been with the company prior to this. They've done a lot for him. He's 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 getting a lot of heat. He's pissing off Santana. He's pissing off Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Rebby, um, pretty much anyone involved with the system because he wants to be in the group. They're not making him a goof. You know, he's been a goof. He's already done that. We've been here, done that with the goof shit. So we get, and then we get Dango versus Santana. Decent enough match. DQ finish. <laughs> but it was, you know, Santana beat the absolute crap out of him. And somehow this leads to Santana versus Jake something at Slammiversary. I guess there was a, a Twitter angle done. Uh, that involved bumping into uh, bumping into one another backstage. So uh, I'm glad they're finding a way to get Santana on the card. Could have been having him do something on this card and working towards that the last couple of weeks. You know, it shouldn't be something we got in the bottom of the ninth inning. Like, okay, Santana's on the card finally. Uh, Tom Hannafin is now talking to Jordan Grace, and he's talking normal. He is speaking normal. The inaudible shit. It's none of that. He's just speaking normal. That's why I say he imitates someone with a radio voice. Because here he sounds great. He's talking to Jordan. Jordan is opening up. I don't care is the problem because I don't care about anything about Ash by Awful Sauce at this point. I've spoken of that ad nauseum, the way that she's been handled up to this point, and I don't care. Don't care, don't care, don't care. And then it shows the personal concierge on the phone with Ash by Awful Sauce, and Rosemary is stalking him in the background. At first, when Rosemary showed up last week, I, I was like, what is this random shit with Rosemary? But then I remembered right around when, when Ash started going full-on comedy that it was the match against Havoc. Or that she took out havoc, and I don't even remember what they did to Rosemary that episode. I think I think I feel like she attacked her previously. I don't remember exactly. Don't really care to be honest, but uh, glad good to see Rosemary on screen. I feel like she is going to remove the personnel concierge from the match at Slam Anniversary, and then Jordan's going to beat the crap out of her, and then we're never going to see either of them again. Then after that contract signing. I did kind of laugh when Santino <laughs> was announcing him down to the ring and, and messing their names up. I, I just thought the Mac Steve McLean. <laughs> I just even though Santino gets on my nerves sometimes, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, so this was all well done. It was. I don't want to say that it wasn't, but you're not going to find me having interest in a contract signing because it's always the same shit. They did a good job of. Mixing a couple angles of there being a lot of anger, a lot of emotion, uh, you know, going off the screen with, I mean, I mean, going off air with things crazy and turning upside down and people going through furniture. They did a good job with that. I just don't like that kind of stuff because it's the same. Okay, we're going to see the contract. There's a table. Someone's going through the table. You know, it's always a fight. It's always a broad. It's the same shit, right? So, like, for me, I'm already kind of checked out. But I, I did think they did a very good job with it. They're going around and they're they're all signing. It is so clear, 
so clear, and it should be, that Joe Hendry's the guy in this match. They're doing a good job with that because you don't want him to just be a here. Um, oh, they did have Nick Nemeth talk on before I get to Joe Hendry here. They had a, a pre-record of him saying he had a torn labor, laborium, but that he would still be at Slammiversary. To nobody's surprise, this reminded me two years ago when the, the Lakers got eliminated from the playoffs and and uh, as they do every year because they suck. But LeBron uh, teased retirement in his kind of exit interview. I, I don't know if I'm coming back next year where everyone knows it's complete horseshit. And then uh, on the ESPYs, before the season starts, he gets on there and announces that he will be returning for his 20th season or whatever. I mean, to no one's fucking surprise. It was just hamming it up. <laughs> so I don't know. I just I drew comparisons to this where I was like, we know this dude's going to wrestle. He put us through this whole long, I'm injured. You're going to wrestle, dude. But anyway, they definitely, this was Joe, the Joe Hendry show as it should be. Uh, Josh Alexander is the one hurting from this because he is coming off like a normal guy. That's why I was saying keep him out of the main event picture because I said no one is asking for him right now to be back in there. And it's clear by the way that he's kind of being uh, booked or even the crowd reactions, you know what I mean? So that's why I was saying find something interesting for him to do with somebody else. Build up his character. You know, find an engaging storyline and then bring Josh later. But here we're just like, hey, we need a steady hand. So let's put him in the match. But he's like the first one that comes down, first one that signs a contract. Like he he is coming off like another dude. So he's hurting from the whole Joe Hendry thing. But Joe Hendry is the one that we don't want to come off like another dude. It's just that it's very obvious. Just like it's very obvious that we're going to get Moose versus Santana here very soon. It's very, very obvious that this match is going to come down to Joe Hendry and Moose as the final two. So we're just going to sit through a long match to where we know exactly who the final two are going to be. So that's where I, I just kind of have a little bit of a problem. AJ Francis comes down with his rich homie Swan, cuts a very good promo, and then tells, uh, hands his belts off to Rich Swan, says these belts are heavy. I have held the digital media championship. No, it's not. Uh, it's one of the most cheaply held cheaply made belts i've ever ever held before when i go to conventions you know if a wrestler's a champion they're like here hold my belt i'm saying okay cool i'll be a fucking mark take a picture of the belt so when i met um crazy steve i got i got to hold, hold the belt it weighs about three pounds same with the um oh man when i met my, matt seidel and he was the x division champion that thing was pretty light as well really only the uh world title seems to be Seems to be very heavy, but anyway, neither here nor there. I you you knew exactly this was this was just to get PCO on screen, and it's PCO. And Ray Wall goes, "What the hell? Or what the hell?" Because that's their friend. Now both of them are what the hell. Uh, but yeah, he comes out, and it, it's just a big brawl. Pre previous to this, though, I don't know if you guys caught it, but when Santino said that AJ Francis spit in his mouth a little, AJ, uh, Santino hit us with a hock tua. <laughs> the crowd, the crowd picked up on it, but it, it was it was kind of funny. Um, but it's a brawl. We a brawl that we knew was going to happen to end the show. Um, I didn't write it in my notes here, but there was something I wanted to say about this whole brawl thing, and I think I probably forgot what it was. Yeah, who cares? Uh, yeah, it, it went. It ended with Moose going through a table. Moose, they book Moose to be a goof every go home show or every pay per view. Like he's in in one way, he's going to end up on his back, whether it's prior to the pay per view or at the actual pay per view. Because the last two, he got attacked at the end of the show with uh, by surprises. And uh, I'll give you my thoughts on Jordan Grace saying there's going to be surprises on Slammiversary when I review or when I preview Slammiversary, I should say. But, uh, you know, to go back to what I was saying, they did a good job with this brawl. I just didn't care because I don't care for contract signing brawls. But I thought uh, to just go off the air like this was pretty good. I know what I was going to say. 
I've I've heard the word bedlam twice in my life. One was because it's a song by Public Enemy. It's not a good song either. It's like a I think Flavor Flav's doing the whole song by himself, and and he actually can't really rap. Like he's more of a hype man. So I, I think Bedlam was like the Flavor Flav solo song on an album, which I didn't really care for. Um, and the other time I heard it is Tom Hannafin. Every time there's a a bra, it's Bedlam. I don't know that people even know what that word means. So that's gonna do it for me. Probably not my best review in the world. It's it's a little early for me today stumbling over myself more than I typically do. But I thought they did a very good go-home episode. I, th- I just thought it was a lot better than the ones they had previously done prior to this. And um, looking forward to Slammiversary. I think there's there's not a lot of heat for Slammiversary. It's not a lot of excitement. But I think this episode uh, did a good job of, of, of getting us there a little bit. So I'm your boy, BQ. I will catch you guys uh, when I'm previewing Slammiversary. Again, I will review Slammiversary. And then I'll be gone for a little bit. I'm out. Peace.